Hello lads and lasses and welcome to episode 57 of the Roker Report podcast. We've just beaten Hull 1-0. We're off the bottom of the table now, which is which is canny. Um, our first home win since Fulham, which mm-hmm. is nice. We are joined today by Nick Barnes. Very, very big welcome to you today. Thanks for coming. Hello. Pro- pleasure. And we've also got Spencer Vignes. Spencer Vignes, how are you doing? Yes. Who good. is Lee Roos's biographer. I am. And worth noting as well, for those that don't know, that Nick Barnes is commentator for BBC Radio Newcastle since 2003. Three. And we're also joined by Gav. How are you? As always. And Connor Bromley. Hi. How's how are you doing? Can't complain. Oh, you've got the Harry Bows in the day. Aye. The Straubs as well. After the, yeah. after the fanny on my head. Well, it's not my fault. I just didn't want to. Just didn't want to buy them. That was all. Unreal. I got I got them the first time. He got them last week. I bought a nice box of Terry's Trottle Orange last week. Like the sensation, well, seg sensations are called. And I've been here for four hours week. today. To be fair, and that got the wrong weight. I, I like, know. but he could get them open. <laughs> <laughs> he took them home. I didn't actually. Bought them. Last, I had a, got a box of chocolates, haven't I? Oh, you did, didn't you? Huh? The, the wagon wheels first week. Good. Anyway, enough with the uh, enough with the food. <laughs> we'll go on to the That's three the word review. Talk. Three word review. We have. Josh Sloan that says get in there we have Death Rogan that says fucking get in we have James Owen that says thank fucking god John Ridley He's says swearing. I know it's ridiculous I don't read John Ridley's out no no that's not <laughs> a good one Malcolm Thorpe says young guns blazing Paul Brown says we go again SAFC Fisherman says Robson shows class Gordon Mason says much needed win Michael Lane great team goal Um your man says least shite team. Uh, so, that's all right. Mr. The Boss Man says football on five. Paul Diamond says rather watch the snooker. Oh, he's a mag him. No, he did that. That's oh, fast forward. Well, yeah, it is, yeah. Quite right. Andy Maguire says never say die. Ollie George says fought for it. I'll throw it to Nick Barnes. How did, what did you make of the game? So, what, three words. Oh, well, <laughs> the um, game more than three words. Uh, <laughs> pretty hard fought. I uh, thought. They did play well. I thought the first half, the opening 20 minutes, I thought they looked confident, actually. For all the f- talk about the Stadium of Light is um, a difficult place to play and has caused a lot of nerves and a lot of uh, heart searching for the players. I actually thought they started very brightly with a lot of confidence. I thought Honeyman was the one player who certainly sort of signified that early doors. I thought Asoro, Asoro and Madger caused Hull all sorts of problems. They, they've certainly given them a headache. I thought some were organised. You know, the goal was huge because I think the big key... For me at the weekend was Sunderland had to score first. If Hull had scored first, I think it could have been a different, different story. But I think scoring first that put Sunderland in the driving seat and then they were organised. Um, and although they had to, to work hard for it, and you know Hull certainly in the second half changed the, you know, changed the games that they were going to throw players on and try and get back in the game. Sunderland stayed, you know, stayed with their game plan um, and saw it through very, very well. Gav? Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think uh, I think as as a team performance goes, that's about as complete as it gets. I don't think um, the scoreline really reflects the performance. I think first half it could have been two or three nil. Um, it was the, probably the, the from the off um, the most impressive thing from my perspective was just how much quicker everything was. Um, the, the tempo was certainly up. I mean, against Cardiff, we barely got moving. The ball, the ball just didn't seem to move for us. Whereas in this game, um, we were right into it when we didn't have the ball. When we did have the ball, we were attacking with purpose. I felt um, there was just a bit of pace about us, and it was it's something that's been lacking in recent weeks. And I think I think it probably came from what's been a bad week. Maybe you know Coleman's just rallied the players and thought you know let's respond in the best way possible with a good team performance and. Uh, fully deserved the three points even though I thought Hull could have maybe got something towards the end we defended well and I think we deserved it I, th- I think having the youngsters in as a group really helped because you had Honeyman Gooch you had Asoro and Madger and Ethan Robson and I think it can sometimes be underestimated how hard it is for one youth product to come up and kind of play with senior players to learn their games they're not familiar so I think having that group of players come in really benefits us whether that continues I'm not sure, Connor. What do you make of the, uh, the no, game against Hull? I would agree. Uh, first thing I would say, the goal. I can't remember Sunderland scoring such a team goal in a, a long time. A goal yeah. that was genuine quality. I know mean, we've seen some good scream as McGeady's put a few nice ones away, but I haven't seen a really good quality goal like that in a long time. Like I was very impressed with how that goal came about. It wasn't 
it didn't look like a team that was struggling the way we scored that. No. And I think that's the injection of the youth. You know, it was, it was pretty much a, a youth move. It was what Honeyman was heavily involved. Obviously, Azoro scored mm. it. Um, I think Maja was, was involved there. Yeah. Yeah, Col- was. Coleman said it, you know, it was straight off the training ground, didn't he? And that, that's that's what I said when I saw it at the time. It was one touch, you know, very well worked. Really good finish as well, yeah. under pressure. Yeah, it was Defe- a good finish. Defenders My, on the them. only thing that surprised me was when I looked at the replay of it, was the goalkeeper didn't go down for it. Yeah. If, yeah. He'd, if he'd dived down, I think the goalkeeper was taken by surprise that yeah. Asoro was going to shoot from where he did. Mm with the precision that he did and right. if you watch it he, he, he sort of dipped his hand down but made yeah. no more effort than yeah, that just to try and stop a, it a lot of composures I mean that was his first league start Asoro so he was really up for it um, I've been critical of Asoro in the past I've watched him play a lot of games for the under 23s where he hasn't done anything um, but you could just tell that he, you know this was his chance and he wasn't going to make you know a meal of it he he was really up for it and he, um, he, he I mean Michael Dawson's an ex-England international defender playing the Champions League for Tottenham he's a you know, I'm not saying that he's still. He's not player. what he was, is he? Yeah, but no, but no. he's still, yeah, he's still a formidable presence yeah. at Championship level. But Benno made a good point before the game: is that you, if you're a young player and you've got a bit of pace, what you want to do is keep running at Dawson. Yeah, yeah last thing Dawson's going to want to do all afternoon yeah. is chase around. Well, yeah. The same flaws as O'Shea has, really, in a he, way. He dove yeah. in for the goal. He dove in to try and stop block the shot. Mm-hmm. You know, that's how that's how far the pace he was at that time. Dawson brought down Azoro for a stonewall penalty. Yeah, I spoke to Asoro afterwards because I mean I haven't seen the replay, but you know, was, I heard different sort of two sides of the fence afterwards. People saying it was, and people saying it wasn't because he went down so easily. But Asoro said basically Dawson stood on his foot, mm. and and that caused him to, to go what down the way he did. I mean, I thought it was penalty one. straight away, yeah. but um, I've seen it back. It's definitely a penalty. Yeah, yeah. I, I, ultimately it didn't matter, but um, it could have done. Well, if you, if with you look it at being one nil, if you look at Dawson's reaction afterwards, he gets up, and walks away because he knows. Yeah, he's got you know, he doesn't guilt. protest it, or he, you know, quite often if a player dives, the the player he's tried to get a penalty out of will jump up and have a go. He didn't. He got up and he turned around, and walked away because I think he knew he got away with it. Mm. And Coleman's been very quick to praise the youngsters as well. He said. Um, uh, after the match, I don't think any team I've ever managed has scored a goal as good as that. Which yes. it's, it's high praise. He's probably it's trying to he's probably trying to lift the um, the youngsters well, in, a bit there, in, including Wales's goal against Belgium. That Sam Vogue's header. Well, that's what I was thinking. That that was one of the best goals of, uh, well, I've ever seen in my as a Welsh goal in the same game. Yeah, maybe he's on about moment. club football. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, it was a good goal. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I mean, you know, watching Sunderland all this season, they, yeah. they score you know a few enough goals, and and to see one that was as polished as Soros. Hey, I tell you what, from an 18 year old, it, yeah, it's it, impressive. Just as importantly, impressive. a clean sheet, yeah. particularly after what happened at Cardiff. Yeah, um, I think there's a defensive unit that was as solid as we've looked all season to be mm. honest and that's including against Wolves I think mm. Clark Salter really it's just about to ask how do you, how yeah, do you think I, I he think, did I think against Cardiff he was uh, you could tell he was a bit off the pace and Coleman straight away said that's his first game of football in seven weeks mm. you know mm. you can tell that the extra week on the training ground's done him good um, probably as good as John O'Shea's played in a couple of years I would say um, but that's the strength of O'Shea isn't it when you talk about Dawson his strength is he knows how to read the game yeah. you know, he hasn't got the legs anymore but if he's in the middle of three two younger players either side of him yeah. that can offer him a bit of cover mm-hmm. someone in front of him to do that as well then his organisational nous is what's important and if you talk to Ty Browning and you talk to Clark Salter both say you know he, he he's just talking at you all through the game yeah. a, b- a big uh, shout out to Lee Catamull as well because he's been written off at times yeah. earlier in the season and he's come, job. Ba- he's come back into the team and he, he performed well a lovely lovely tackle on him well I say tackle hatchet job on Sam well, Larson it, towards it, yeah, the end of the game it, as, you know we said at the weekend he took one for the team there yeah I definitely because they're on the you break know, you can afford to do that mm-hmm. as long as he didn't get him sent off which is a, a danger with referees that they just see Katamo made the challenge and suddenly yeah, you, know, you look that. at Undong being sent off at Cardiff yeah. Yeah, yeah. that could easily have been a, a, that know, was a nasty it, tackle it, that it was a good tackle I mean I loved it but what the one the Seb Larson one or the Undong one the Larson one or the Larson one, oh, the last one. Uh, it last made a meal of it as Mark Larson mind. makes a meal of things yeah, yeah he does I mean he'd been in the referee's ear all the game as well Well, he, he, he was, that was a common uh, characteristic of his when he was yeah. at Sunderland as well um, just to, to move on to Robson as well I was really impressed with Robson I think the way he just mm. he sits in midfield he doesn't necessarily go forward he was tidy he yeah, just did a job knits everything together yeah he did a job without you know pulling up trees he just was obviously told to go out mm. there and just keep it simple make the passes take the tackles and, and just do a job don't try and be a hero on the afternoon and I think that's just slotted he'd slotted quietly into the system and the game without uh, to have the, to have the discipline to do that as a youngster as yeah. well for, for me is, is quite impressive yeah I think he, he he gave a similar kind of performance in the Borough game I thought especially, especially in the second half he, uh, he did a good job of just winning the ball back and you know recycling possession and mm. and just making it look simple which is what he does to be honest he's a very unspectacular player um, 
but he, you know, he, there's been a, a void in this team for a while now for a player like that. I think. I think um, maybe Kirchhoff was the last player we had who, who did that quite well on a consistent basis. And I think he was unlucky to be dropped at Cardiff. I thought, let's say I was at Boran, I thought he played well. I didn't think he deserved to get dropped. Um, he's certainly solidified his place in the team now. I mean, he's going to probably go out and try and buy a centre midfielder, Coleman. But at least it shows we've got options now. I think I think Ethan Robson, you know, he wouldn't he wouldn't struggle at all in that team um, mm. on a regular basis. So I was pleased to say that. I think what's interesting, you know, is from uh, I, I should say I'm sitting in a room here, surrounded by people who live and breathe northeastern football. You know, and I live in South Wales. I grew up in Sussex. I'm a Brighton and Hove Albion fan. Although I'm, you know, I I, I like Sunderland and and follow them from afar. I'm not in the goldfish bowl of this area. <laughs> and when I uh, I saw that result, uh, I saw that, you know, you'd won. And you think, yep, excellent. Because more to the point that if you'd lost, that would have been three points for Hull. And at this stage, you know, as Nick and I were talking just before we came on air, it's you've got to beat those sides around you. Because a defeat or a draw is, uh, you know, three points or one point to your rivals. And, you know, you're getting more and more cut adrift at the bottom. Um, I think... From particularly as somebody who who followed Wales a lot, you know, as a journalist throughout the Chris Coleman years, and was very surprised when Chris came up here. I think now looking at the league table, I think it makes a, a hell of a lot better reading hmm. than it did a few weeks ago. And I think I like to think, you know, if if, if 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 a few weeks back when Chris first joined, and you look at that, I'd have been massively surprised to see Sunderland where they are now compared to where they, I thought they would be. You've got, you know, a hope now. There's a long way to go, but you look at it and you think, okay, I'll take that. You've beaten Hull. You've got a clean sheet. That's what I was saying. Clean sheets and, you know, confidence, you know, for the for the defence and for the keeper. Yeah, I think you're in, you know, you're, you're in better shape now it, than you it, were a few it, weeks ago. It was a huge win. And my, my only fear is that we've seen this already with Chris Coleman. You yeah. get a good win mm. and then it all comes suddenly. You know, the balloon gets popped in the next game. And the but irony that... is now the next game, like it was against Fulham, is Birmingham City. Yeah. They have to go to Birmingham City now and get yeah. something because they can't allow themselves to get such a big result against Hull, put themselves back in it, give themselves the confidence of that, and then allow themselves to be beaten by a team who are down there with them. You're right, but and it's they do need that momentum if yeah. we're going to get out of this. We're yeah. going to need momentum. But I mean, so often it's a new manager you know, will go into a, a club and if you've got the right building blocks already there and there are no problems, quite often you can have that bounce mm. where you can go on a good run. You know, of one, two, three, four, five games unbeaten, you can see it immediately. With all due respect to Sunderland, there's a lot of issues there. So the idea of even having kind of, you know, a, an unbeaten run of six or seven games, maybe that's realistic. Most important thing, maybe, is that, you know, okay, you may lose every other game, but it's important that the game in between you win. Yeah. Win more yeah, than winning. you, you yeah, win. Win more than you draw, games. because draws are useless at this point of the season. You know, if you win one every, you know, every other game, you'll be fine. You'll stay up. That's it. Stay away from the draws. Stay away from the morale-beating defeats. And that's the thing. After the Cardiff game, you think 4-0, what's that going to do to morale? Yeah. But it bounced back. The, the result lifted us to 20 seconds, so we'll level on 25 points with Hull. Um, they've got a superior goal difference, so that touches upon what you said there. It was vital that we did get that win. And otherwise, they the would point, Hull otherwise... as well are being sucked in. Yes. Was, you know, they're going down, and you can them see them sometimes the downward tra- trajectory. Lackins took over they've only won the one game at home they have had four that away bounce. games have all ended 1-0 defeats yeah. they, they all seem to be clutching at straws at the end of the game as well you had Milo and Atkins coming oh, yeah. out saying that it was the best warm up they'd ever had on the pitch before the game and they don't know how, how it went they're the worst so team wrong. we've played all season yeah. in my eyes I think well someone told me from Hull that that was the worst performance Hull have played under Atkins away from home mm. I spoke to a Hull fan after the game and he was pretty resigned to relegation sounded like us last week to be honest um, <laughs> well, in crew, fairness crew. there's a parallel between the two yeah, teams yeah. they've been they've been, you know both teams changed their manager both teams mm. didn't really get a, you know significant bounce from changing the manager absent ownership uh, exactly. fans, financial fans problems. turning away the ones that do turn up are doing it out of habit I just, like Myler and I just think Campbell. again kind of taking myself out of this situation and watching from you know afar i.e. South Wales you look at it and you think okay Sunderland we all knew there was issues there Hull, I didn't wasn't really aware that there was such a kind of a problem there. So you know, Sunderland again, or rather Hull, getting dragged into it, where you think they were in better shape than perhaps they were, and and they're not winning at the moment. No, they had a bit more money to spend, but on the whole, they've still got the same issues with ownership. And yeah, things aren't great there. Yeah, by a long way. But I I, I didn't think maybe their problems were to the same extent of Sunderland's. I mean, and football wise, I think you look at the way they played the. 
two centre midfielders just couldn't get in the game. Mm. Two experienced players, Myler and Lawson. Yeah. Um, apparently Which is significant because Myler, when, when we were at Hull, when he came on at half time, ran it. Absolutely yeah, ran yeah, yeah. Yeah. Every time he plays, also, to be honest, he yeah. plays quite well. Yeah. Um, apparently, the, the loan players from Chelsea just aren't very good. Mm. But get played every week. There's obviously an agreement there. Yeah. For yeah. To play when and the fact fit. that three of the back four was Chelsea yeah. loan I thought the left back was terrible. Well, it's oh, funny. Yeah. I did a bit of, a bit of work looking at kind of the way we set up. It's very obvious that with Robson playing, he's given Honeyman that license to. When we were playing with Gibson, Gooch, and Honeyman, the three of them weren't effective because Honeyman wasn't doing his proper job and Gooch wasn't. Whereas now with Catamol and Robson sitting. Honeyman can be a bit more forward and he was pretty much just working the left wing with Oviedo. Yeah. You look at the game, the amount of time that Honeyman was on the left-hand side with Oviedo and we absolutely blitzed them on that wing. Yeah. And although we didn't get much success from it overall, it is one of the reasons we won the game. Yeah. Um, and you can see the impact of Robson from that because even defensively, having him and Catamol in front of the back three, just give her that protection. The two of them, you know, Robson didn't lose an aerial battle. No. Robson won seven tackles, which is you know, mm. that's, that's quite a, a large amount. And Catamol won six. We dominated that midfield area, and it it protected the defence, and it allowed our well, front four really. I would include Oviedo in there. Yeah. Oviedo, Honeyman, Azora, Magia to just destroy Hull in the first half, and we could have been two or three nil up by half time because of that. Second half, I think we struggled a bit because you know you, you're desperate to hold on to the win. But that first half really changed the way they, they yeah first know, half played as well. The the game plan worked very well, and I think it was the inclusion inclusion of Robson that, that changed it. It was it was interesting to see Robson as the deeper of the two as well. He sat in front of the defense and just shielded them, and Catamol was the one. I mean that's it. That's where he's at his best, really putting pressure on on attackers and and trying to press people out wide. That was basically the role he took up. It was kind of like. More like the the Lee Catamore we saw when Gus Poyer was here, yeah. who very much ran midfield. Um, and I felt I felt that Robson's job was very simple. He wasn't given a you know a big job. He was just told to go out there, sit deep, win the ball, recycle it, and he did that perfect. He, he did. He, he if you look at the way he played in that game, you know his passing was good. The, he did everything that you'd want from a central midfielder, and it, it gave Catmull maybe a bit more confidence because he's been playing with. Well, not be nasty, but you know, and Dong's been well, shocking all season. Ca- I and think half the problem with Catamol sometimes is he feels that he feels the need to do everything in the midfield. He feels like it's all on his shoulders, and that tells. So he can't you can't run it by himself. Yeah, I think I think there's a budden centre midfield partnership there. I think that could be one of the reasons why we do eventually turn this round. That certainly from what I saw, I was impressed. It's the first time I've looked at the centre midfield and thought they look good as a unit. I mean, Gibson's had a few good games, but what would be interesting when Gibson's fit and whether. Chris Coleman takes the decision to put him back in because Gibson's passing. I mean, in, the, in those last few games he was playing, mm. you know, suddenly there was a player who's been castigated and 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 hadn't had a good time. Suddenly, starting to find his feet and you know his range of passing in those last couple of games, he started to take a you know a grip in midfield. At least, I mean, from Chris Coleman's point of view, he'll have the op- you know the, he'll have opportunity. You know, he's got players: Gibson, Catamol, Robson, Wilson. If he needs him, he suddenly got more players in the squad that you can yeah. turn to um, and, and suddenly you, you know, you're starting to look at a squad that you can actually perhaps do something with and that's without any of the players coming in yet I still think we need another central midfielder still need someone who, yeah. can, who, who can has got some sort of authority in the middle I'd say the problem we've got is that the, the central midfielders that we do have not aren't very good at seeing fit no <laughs> um, a lot and of every, I think players. we were expecting by this point to have Paddy McNair as a regular feature on the team still injured he's got another issue Um Johnny Williams is back in training, but how long he stays fit is anybody's guess. Catamol's prone to injury. Catamol again. Gibson, to be honest, I don't even think Gibson will play again this season. I think they said it would be up to three months he would be out, and then you run about the last four weeks of the season now. Uh, he's got to get himself fit again after with, with four weeks to go. He might he might play the last few games, maybe. Mm. Um, Hopefully we'll be safe by then. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, well. I right, say so, so much of football is luck. I remember having this big argument over several beers with um, people of a certain age who might remember you know, Steve Foster the Brighton captain yeah, in the 1983 yeah, cup yeah. final with the big with the big. he wore a hair great band. big headband mm. you know, strapping headband and that was you know how you could tell him and uh, over several beers uh, we had this argument whereby he said that so much in sport is luck and I was like no you make your own luck 
but in the end you always believed in Steve Foster and he would always win you round and it was and basically he had certain key things he said so much of it is luck and he broke football in various kind of FA Cup finals and key moments in football over the previous years to that all down to kind of like and and it is it's going to be luck as well who you can keep fit who you can you know opposition Mm. you know um, injuries as well well, Saturday, I would say he could probably apply that Saturday. The amount of times the ball span a- across our eighteen-yard box and Hull just didn't capitalise. There was a there was a five ten minute period where they had two or three chances which should have been put away. Half <laughs> chances though, weren't they? Really? Um, you think? I, I think Fraser Campbell had a really good yeah. one which dropped to him. Um, but at the same time, we had one which ran along the goal line. And nobody was there to tap it in. So you, you see it. it I think more more often than not we're unlucky Sunderland I think mm. it's about time we had a bit of luck yeah, really. yeah exactly you, you've yeah. got a player like Darren Gibson there who but you need that little well. bit of luck to kind of get out of a situation like this and I think if, if the breaks go for you Chris Coleman said he would rather be a lucky manager <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go then you see <laughs> he'd say the choice is lucky or what's the other alternative but basically said I would yeah take lucky all the time yeah. t- talking about luck as well but we had a we had a bit of a bit of quality at the end from Robin Reuter to, to save the day Mm, yeah, good. I, yeah. Mean, it, it, I saw it back, and I didn't. It didn't look as good, but at the time, it, it was such a tense moment in the game. Mm. Um, point, point blank, Ridge. I mean, it's straight at him, but he still got to save it. Yeah, he's going to be there. Um, but he 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 certainly took a lot from it because he jumped straight up and screamed. He knew yeah. he made it. Well, look at Myers' reaction. He can believe. He yeah. can't believe he missed it. And in times gone by, that that would be a very Sunderland thing to happen. Was that David Myler, excellent oh, player, yeah. gets the winner at the stadium, uh, the equaliser at the stadium like, in the last minute? Yeah. yeah. Um, we'll move on to a Twitter question from Josh Sloan. Is the result a confidence boost? We need to climb up the league. I'll go to Nick first. What, well, you have to say yes because they need they needed a win. They needed a win at home, and and they need wins to go up the league. So, um, I, I, as I say, you know, I said before, I thought they looked confident to start the game, mm-hmm. and I think they'll take a lot of confidence from seeing it out without conceding a goal. And the young lads, well, the young lads just want to play football. And I think, yeah. you know, that they'll, be, you know, a sorrow, a madger will be just loving every minute of it. Um, they'll want to start at Birmingham. You know, they want as many minutes on the pitch as they can get. Robson's come through well. Honeyman, I mean, the, the, the strange thing is this season that George Honeyman has probably played himself into contention to be player of the season. Yeah. But as we said at the weekend, that's an indictment more of where Sunderland are mm. than the qualities that yeah. George Honeyman's got. Yeah. Because... Yeah. With the best one in the world, he's a lovely lad, and, he's, and, he, and he, he works his heart out. You know, if you were to look at a team in the top three or in the Premier League, George Honeyman would be struggling to get in it. Mm-hmm. So that's that, that's how far yeah, Sunderland yeah. have come. But you know, that's where we are at the moment. So get on there, get in there. That's yeah. what Honeyman's bringing to the team. Let him carry on. Connor, do you think we can climb up the league off the back of this result? Is this the moment where we finally get started? I think I think it's a turning point. Um, it's all about building it. You can't just win the I mean if we just keep winning the odd game that'll be why we'll go down you know that's why teams go down they win a game they can't capitalise on it but we thought the Wolves performance would, yeah, might, exactly. be oh, we know, Fulham might be a turning point we thought Fulham might be a turning point we've been through it a million times I mean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, 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 spoken I ref- like a broken man <laughs> I reflected on some of the, the early results Coleman got um, if you look at the defeats that we had we always responded straight away with a good performance or win mm. um, so I mean, I, I wasn't actually surprised that we played like we did after the Cardiff game because if you look back at the, the time that Coleman's been here, more often than not, we do respond well to bad results. But Nottingham like Forest after Sheffield United, yeah, and yeah, and the Wolves game Wolves came after, game after, after defeat. The, yeah, yeah. It, it's there is a there is a pattern there. I, I guess what he's got to try and do is nail now the consistency of winning a game and then going into yeah. the next game and winning that, which is a very winnable game but I mean you, you know I, what, where I tear my hair out is games like Sheffield United yet again they went to Sheffield United on a bad run would have been an absolutely ideal time to play them and they got rolled over big time by Sheffield United and made and them Cardiff, look like world beaters and Cardiff and Cardiff again, the same Cardiff, on a, on a yeah. bad run Barnsley bad run they were so, on and played them you know what, yeah. what is in the psyche that's allowing mm. the team to be rolled over like that now they're going to go to Birmingham who uh, uh, you know they're, they're down there they're struggling uh, they're, they're dro- you know dragging out some draws and things, but it's, it's got to be surely an ideal time They've to go. They've got to beat the sides there. around them. It's what we were saying earlier. Yeah. I mean, you know, whether Sunderland, you know, stand or fall, won't be determined by the result at Cardiff or Wolves, but it will be determined against you know sides like Hull, three points already. Yeah. Birmingham, it's those sides down there. You know that bottom half of the table. It's so competitive. You know, it's unrelenting. Goal difference is a bit of a worry, but. If yeah, it does but that's all. Yeah, but, but when when Birmingham came to the stadium, of lights, 
I distinctly remember thinking Birmingham are really poor and we matched them for how poor we were that day and I don't think there's any I, I mean touch wood I don't think there's any way we're going to repeat that performance because it was dire over Christmas against Birmingham mm, I thought I thought that their, their front three was quite impressive actually did you ask Gallagher yeah. so you see scoring goals now Sam Gallagher Sam yeah, 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 on goal. from Southampton but what you've also I, I was at a, a St Andrews a few weeks back reporting and the atmosphere there is awful absolutely awful I think it may be one of those occasions where actually it suits you better playing away mm. because you're you're in an, an, an atmosphere where you know things just haven't gone right there since they sat Gary Rower you know it's it, that was a bizarre decision you know at the time since there I think they've, they've won something like seven games in two years mm. year and a half two years yeah, it's, just, pretty, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> it's just <laughs> it's awful yeah it is isn't it it's more yeah it's runs, yeah. Yeah, fourteen. Yeah, about fourteen the, months. They've got new it? owners. They've got new owners, and the new owners just. No, oh, it's Dece- it. yeah, December two thousand and sixteen, and they didn't win another. I think they won one game under Zola, and then a couple under Harry Redknapp at the end, and then it's whatever they've won so far this season. So well, have they won away games? yet? I mean, they haven't won away when they came to the stadium night, had they? And, I'm not, I'm not and that sure. goes back to. It was just towards the end of last season. Yeah, yeah, but it is, it is. You know, sometimes you just go to a ground. You know, it's, it's, you'll know. You know, Nick. Oh, you, 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 you go around and you <laughs> you go around to some grounds and you can just almost smell death there. You know, <laughs> damn. You're talking it's, 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 like, you know. it's like <laughs> well, I was trying to put it politely, but yeah, um, take on the stadium, I like. But put, yeah, put it put it this way. You know, I remember. You know, as, as somebody who who you know for the Observer, you know, covered various managers in the past and has seen you know a, a, a few kind of Sunderland dodgy seasons. You know, I'd I'd say St Andrews was right up there. It was kind of you know something from Transylvania. You know, it's just, <laughs> just, you know, everyone looking at the floor, everyone hating the manager. You know, it's like that first misplaced pass. You know, crowd down the buck. Wham! Everybody comes out. It's just like, oh my word! You know, and this is like the fourth minute. You think this is not a happy place. So playing down there, I think, could work in your favour. It, I think it's imperative that we we'll start well. I think we'll definitely have to start well. Get the as you say, get the crowd on the back yeah. and, and change out the Right, Force them, play high up, play high up the field, press them right in their mm-hmm. faces, and at somebody, somebody will shank some pass, bang, that'll be it. Well, hopefully, um, a sorrow and magic can provide that, that youthful vigour again. Right, we're going to take a quick, quick break and we'll be back in a second. Right, welcome back to part two of the Rotor Report podcast. Um, we're going to go into a few questions for Nick Barnes since we've got you today. Uh, we've got one from James Nichols, one of our writers. Uh, he, he says, what's Coleman like behind the scenes and what are your thoughts on his tenure so far? What's he like behind the scenes is um, just utterly professional. Um, he's not one of those managers that goes out to be your friend. He just, come to, he, he just comes and does the business, but he's very open um, in terms of anything you can ask him. There, don't seem, there doesn't seem to be any boundaries about you know what you can and can't ask with him, um, and uh, and you know pre-match press conference, for instance, uh, the radio one. I mean, I can I can ask four or five questions, and that's fifteen minutes worth of answer from mm. him because he does. He is a good talk, talk a lot. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> but what he what he says is good. But, but you know, you read the he, comments. He repeats back himself and... a lot sometimes, but yeah. he does. You know, he, he doesn't um, measure, he? shy away from. Yeah, he knows what he's going to say, but he doesn't shy away from tackling any issues such as the Jack Rodwell situation just for, as one example um, likewise post-match um, he's in no hurry to get away he'll answer every question um, so you, you know that's all you ask as a reporter is something I mean Roy Keane was similar mm. um, uh, there's a lot of similarities bizarrely yeah. between the you're two you're right actually yeah, yeah. Um, so from that um, basis yeah very professional very very good to work with what was the second part of the question um, what are your <laughs> thoughts on his tenure so far uh, well, so far um, so far so good I think he's got two high hands tied behind his back I think you know he's having to, to to juggle a lot of situations he's not helped by the distractions of such things as um, Jack Robwell and Dong Kone etc etc you know that it's, it's, it, there are, those are things he can do without mm-hmm. uh, at the same time he's been prepared to blood the youngsters he's, he's you know, shown no fear in allowing the younger players into the squad and giving them their head start at them in games and, there's, and it's clearly been a, a transition because you know under Simon Grayson they've won the one game drawing a lot but losing they weren't they don't seem, didn't seem to be anywhere out of the tunnel for Simon Grayson he was chopping and changing I think he just in the end was throwing the cards in the air and didn't know what to do with them at least there's some sort of plan with Chris Coleman now and yes it, it it's a bit stuttering we get one result we get a bad game but they do bounce back from that we were saying before you know that from every bad result there's been a good result um, so in that sense there is some progress with him and 
the only way he is going to progress really realistically is to get new faces in is to get new players in but that's the big question mark as to just how many new players he can get in A in this transfer window and B what the budget's going to be like in the summer because that mm. could be another big stumbling block for him well we'll move on to transfers actually before you ask you another couple of questions Chris Martin was rumoured wasn't he lads and it, it seems like it's it's not going to happen uh, I, I wouldn't say that I think he's probably just taking some time to weigh up his options actually um, it was you know known that he was going to go away with Derby to Dubai on the warm weather training camp and that's what he's done so I mean, he's in no rush to pick a club. Do we um, rate him? I, th- I haven't looked at his record, yeah. I think I, he's got a pretty good championship record, yeah. Haven't seen enough of him in the last year, possibly. On his day, yeah, days yeah. gone by, but I'm not too sure, you know, if the player that there is now is the same player that was there about two years ago. Well, he recently oh. signed a new contract. He signed a new contract last year when he was at Fulham, and he, I think he scored one goal since. Yeah, I don't know if that's played in. If he's earned big money on that last deal or whatever, I'm not sure. Um, he's, he, he is of that age, isn't he? Coming towards his thirties now, and sometimes you you do question the the hunger and desire of a player when they've already you know spent the vast majority of their career playing Championship football. Um, but I, I, I think he'd be a good sign at this stage. I think his his technical ability and his and his strength would be a big asset to our front line I, I think, think his experience yeah. as well and, and, and Chris Coleman yeah. has shown that actually he can get more out of some players yeah yeah. you know look what he did with Wales you know you got average players yeah and melded them together into a real team and if you can get that out of the players that he can I mean you know he, he he's in a market where he's, he, he's he's restricted as to what he can buy in or get in or loan in because he's not going to buy I mean so uh, I just think they do you know for all that Asoro and Maggio have looked good they do need someone with experience in there yeah. This is a long run in now. I mean, for all the you know yeah. talk, we've got to bounce. But I mean, this run in now, the four months is the hardest of the lot. A long slog. This is when the pressure suddenly yeah. starts to apply. Um, by all means, Redden won them as well, but they're not working as hard as we are to get them. So um, I think it'll be interesting. I think I've said this, obviously off 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 air to use, but I think any business that Sunderland do will come probably in the last few days of the window. I just don't I don't think when you when all you're doing is shopping in the loan market it really is players are gonna wait as long as they possibly can to see what offers come their way. They're not yeah, gonna yeah. rush. Unless it's like a Jay Clark Salter where they just want him to play football and he, he's coming from a club where he's not featuring like a Chelsea, then great for him. But I mean players like Martin are gonna have a number of clubs involved in, yeah. in, in trying to get his you know, trying to get his services on board and I think we're just gonna to have to wait and be patient and luckily for us we don't play till next Tuesday. And of course so the thing the is day before the deadline which is the Yeah, yeah but it's you know worry, it's, it's 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 not just uh, you know, for a for a place for, say for instance in, in, in Martin's position, it's not just what offers come in. You've got to look at where the clubs are that are interested in you are. You know, for every kind of passing, you know, couple of days, you know, week you know, clubs are going up, clubs are going down, so you can assess, well, you know, oh. what kind of a hole am I going into? I think, or... think Redden are only four points. I think Redding so... are probably the greatest underachievers this season in the championship. Yeah. But yeah. I think the, the big selling point for Sunderland is, I think, is Chris Coleman. Yes. I yeah. think that's the one thing that the players do say you know, yeah. in, immediately Chris Coleman comes in for you, they are interested because mm. of who he is. And he's yeah. going to be playing every week. You mm. know, he's guaranteed football pretty much every week he's fit here because we just don't have yeah. any other options. I'm sure Redden have got other options up front. As long as um, he comes and wears the mantle and doesn't think he's going to get an easy ride, but I think only an idiot would think I don't think Coleman would allow him. I don't no, think... No. I don't have you ever got Boone sent back? Yeah, the interesting yeah. thing is about um, players coming to Sunderland as well. As earlier in pre-season, I remember talking to... Adam Matthews thinking that a player like Matthews would have no sense of loyalty to Sunderland and would you know be champing at the bit to get away mm-hmm. but strangely he came straight out and said look for all the problems I've had this is still a brilliant club and you talk to players and all the players that have left here and you see them at various games I've got nothing but respect and, and speak very very well about Sunderland Football Club whatever problems they're in at the minute yeah. and and you know, the bottom line is you know you're a football player the the facilities the academy of light are fantastic mm. the stadium's fantastic it's got the potential you know to, to, oh, yeah. to, when it's full to be no, amazing no doubt um and from you know a player's perspective that is a far better option than going to burton albion with no disrespect to burton no. albion or some of the other clubs in the championship so there is still you know some sort of um pull for players to come to sunderland and i think chris coleman arriving that's just you know the icing on the cake because Chris Coleman's clearly got some sort of kudos when it comes to football. Yeah, no, you're right. I've got to say the old corny one, and again, as, as speaking as somebody who doesn't live in this part of the world, uh, is geography. 
which has been, you know, the curse of many a kind of broken northeastern transfer in the past, you know, is 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 players once they realise exactly how long the A1 is, <laughs> you know, and you know how far away from London nightclubs and even Midlands nightclubs it is, you know, they think twice about actually making, you know, the trip. I mean, you know, for for, for all I know, um, Martin, you know, we were talking about Burton on Trent. He lives near there. So yeah. do you really want to relocate at that stage of your life and everything and, and come a couple of hundred miles north? Or would you just take the easy option and you'd be looking for a club somewhere around that Midlands cluster, you know, that Midlands belt? It's an interesting one because I think Lewis Graben, for all, for all he said at the start of the season, he didn't mind the move from the south coast to the northeast. I think in the end, it was one of the factors he went back. Yeah. You know, but apart from the yeah. position that the club were in, I think Lewis Graben was probably finding it difficult to adjust to moving from Bournemouth to... It either clicks or it doesn't. And he spent his whole career yeah. in... You know, south of London, basically. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit of a, a bit of a culture shock moving up if you've uh, if you've spent most of your career in the south of London. We touched on the on the show last week as well that for a millionaire in the northeast, there's not a, a lot to do really, is there? Not a lot, not, not a lot of <laughs> I can't on, on, believe we're having this conversation, but yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> you know, really, you know, for, well, from that point of view, you know, footballers are like that. It's, well, it's, if you've got that money, you're going to want to spend it on something. Another name we've been linked with is Emerson Hindman from Bournemouth. I don't know a lot about him, I must confess. No. Um, we reported on this yesterday. It was a, came out of nowhere, really. Fox Sports were reporting it over in the US. He's a United States international. Central midfielder. Central player, midfielder. Spent some time on loan at Rangers last year. Uh, won the Young Player of the Year. Um, He's a Kit Simons player, isn't he? Yeah, yes, he is. Yeah. Kit Simons knows him came through under him Matt Fulham um, apparently Eddie Howe spoke just a few days ago about potentially loaning him out saying that they would probably look towards the end of the window to get him out somewhere um, I think from what I've read about him I can't say a lot because I haven't seen him play but he does seem like the type of midfielder that's on need it's someone who plays in front of a two mm. who gets goals Um I mean, how far along that is anybody's guess, really. But it was, it was, it was said that it was pretty close. But it's just pure speculation at this point. You could, it could just be an agent trying to get his name out there. You know, I mean, the, yeah, the, Fox the, Sports as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> Gavin and I've had this conversation about you know, there's so many names in the frame, if you like. But I mean, there's undoubtedly they have got a long list of players mm-hmm. that they're interested in. You, you know, you bear in mind you've got Neil McDermott, Kit Simons, Adrian Tucker, Chris Coleman all working on players they've watched they know about think of those contacts and, and, books and there well Neil McDermott's yeah. contacts book is yeah. you know, second to none because of his work with um, Adidas, Adidas yeah. Yeah. and you know Deli Ali and all, all those players that he he, he brought yeah. through so he will have you know a, a list of names himself so there's going to be a long list of names basically I think on the basis that they're going to struggle to get you know many of them in mm. A because of the restrictions they're working under with the money they've got and B in, in attracting them to yeah to Sunderland so they needed a long list yeah it would be it would be interesting to see if we did go for that type of midfielder though I think like I said earlier we do need another one and if we're going to add one I would like to see us bring one in that and score goals well I think you want know, people years, yeah. young and hungry yeah yeah young and hungry but like I say attributes he would bring in terms of goals would be more than welcome because I don't think since Craig Gardner was here we've really had a centre midfield player that scores goals and Craig, Craig Gardner didn't score that many that no, many goals. But he was, uh, he was the odd spectacular one. It must be said, mind. I, I don't think we've got any central midfielders who've scored this season, other than Honeyman. If you count him, well, the, I can't the, think disturbing fact for me, well, disturbing yeah. oh, yeah. for me at the weekend was before a sorrows goal. The combined total of goals in that eleven, that starting eleven this season, was four. Crazy. Wow. Well, so oh my, you, you know, where does that leave you in terms of where are you where are your goal scorers? And now yeah. you're, you're leading goal scorer with five are sitting on the bench. Mm-hmm. You know that that since Graben went, you know, love him or loathe him, he did supply two yeah, times yeah. more goals than anybody else. So they do need to find someone in that ilk. Yeah. Even and, and and as often as not, how many times in the past, and, and definitely in the Championship, have you expected midfielders to weigh in with goals? Mm. And yeah, even to. your centre halves, your centre halves haven't scored. We, so you know we there is a worry. threat from set pieces. I think that's I, I've I've actually wrote about this as well, but I think I think there's a big issue probably spans back a lot of years now uh, we don't recruit athletic big players um, which is kind of why you look at the squad now and you think small weak not very quick um, going forward that has to be addressed um, short term it would be nice if we brought in two or three players with a bit of pace a bit of height just so we can mix it up in certain games um, and like I say it, it's actually quite frustrating that you see how many corners we actually get and we don't convert any of them well the irony is yeah. of all players from set pieces and corners Billy Jones is more the most likely to score <laughs> and Lamine Corny who's not, not playing yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean you look at that 
the players that Allardyce bought in and how physical and dominating we were in the box then. Well, you well, know, Corona Corona was Kukul. ridiculous. I mean, I mean, remember when he, he wiped Yaya Tour out oh, against, yeah, yeah, against yeah. Man City? Yeah. The yeah. thing is, with, ev- with every passing corner that they take and they do nothing with it, it's more of a hindrance and it's more of a headache, isn't it? Um, because it's in the back of the player's so- mind. It's like, oh, instead of thinking, oh, it's a corner, it's... Oh, well, it's cool. we get out of we're so weak at defending what's them. What's the plan here? You know, we could have conceded it from a corner at the weekend yeah. two or three times. Yeah. The whole played a very simple routine where the kind of boxed out our centre backs and they played a low ball across and the guy fired it over the top. That could very easily have been a goal. Well, but the they didn't score either. And they're well, not scoring either. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, good point. Good point. Well, well in, as you're right, the goalkeeping is horrendous. You know, uh, right there, can't catch a ball from a corner. We certainly struggle to do it and steal. The less said, the better, really. Yeah. Well, then, then again, I think you've got to look at the amount of clean sheets that Rout has kept since Coleman came in. I think there's definitely been an improvement there. And it, as mm. the the defence becomes more confident, the goalkeepers are going to play better. Um, that was a confident save he made at the end of the game. I think yeah. the whole team was... You, mm. could, you could tell from the way we started and we got the early goal. We were buzzing off confidence and that's, that's what won us that game, effectively. And that's going to go from goalkeeper to the top. Um, I, think, I think if... When we're on the subject of recruitment, I think if Coleman can just add a few people, that can just change it up. Like we say, we've got Williams coming back into the team soon. Hopefully McNair. Hopefully, dare I say, Coney, which I think we're going to get onto soon. Um, players like that, that that can just help us change it up when we are playing twice a week and we are getting injuries. It'll make all the difference. Mm. Uh, another name that's been linked is Ethan Am. Pardew, I think he's called from Chelsea. Amadou, yeah. Amadou, 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 Chelsea. Yeah, 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 Mexico. Welsh, is he Welsh? He's Welsh. He is, he is, yeah, Welsh fire. Well, his dad, I remember, you know, Nick will remember, he, yeah, Kwame, who played for Swansea and uh, an Exeter as well, didn't he? Yeah. Um, and well, of Ethan course, came through the ranks at Exeter, he was a 15 year old yeah. when he made his debut. Yeah. And they thought very, very highly of him. And Chelsea were in straight away to buy him. Um, he's played largely for their under 23s, um, but he is highly thought of. He is a very tidy player, yeah. but whether he would be the kind of player that you would want in a championship relegation well, Chelsea battle. also seem reluctant to let him go out on loan. Started in midweek, didn't he? Because he started a few yeah. games, mm. I think. But the link, obviously, is Wales there. It is a Wales thing. Because Coleman he has a... out after the Middlesbrough game when he was asked, he said straight away, um, when we were all trying to guess who it was coming in from Chelsea, was it going to be Clark Salter or Ampadu? And he said straight away, it's not Ampadu. Ooh, which probably means it is. <laughs> well, it was. I would think. Soldier, it I would out. think. Yeah. I mean, but um, I like him. But then I might say that because I've got an extra bias. <laughs> Interestingly, Chris gave um, Ampadu his debut in his in Chris's last final Welsh yeah, international did, game yeah. at home against, against no Panama. 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 Panama yeah. and drew that one was one. that was Ampadu's um, debut. Yeah, one on draw. And he, 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 I think Wales were one nil up when he went off. He was subbed in the second half, but he was subbed, from what I remember, to a pretty generous round of applause. Mm. You know, it was it was very encouraging the way he played. And Panama, you might think, who are Panama? Panama are at the World Cup. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> Wales are. Well, the only thing so... with him is a big, it's a big ask again. He's a young lad to move from London to the northeast, and he's brought up in the West Country. You know, he's you know, basically brought up in Devon, and now he's in London, and suddenly to. Yeah, he's got. Really be familiar with him, won't yeah, it? it can yeah. be the mega well, players. Well, Kevin, yeah, Kevin, yeah. Kevin, Kevin the, the thing, the thing yeah. there that would concern me isn't so much isn't so much the distance because I mean you know Ampadu knows he's coming into good hands you know with Chris and mm. people who care for him. It's more the fact of going into a, like a championship relegation dogfight, you know. It's, it's, and he hasn't played many games, has he? Handful of games no, he for Chelsea. He played against Norwich last week. Um, but you know, it's a big ask for a you know a, a young lad. He's still quite slight physically as well. So you know, if you're looking for a big kind of strapping guy, or you know, tear up the pitch, yeah. I think he's not the kind of guy. But for him though, he he's got to be looking at Abraham last year, and he was at Bristol City who struggled, and Abraham's came out of it smelling the roses. Yeah, yeah. He's done yeah. phenomenally from that playing in the Premier League. You've got to back yourself, haven't you? That's the thing. Yeah. He he probably would fancy the move I think because it could be the making of it and if it doesn't work out then you've always got the excuse of well Sunderland's a mess so and, he's only, <laughs> and he's only yeah. 17 year old yeah. yeah, he's got plenty of time to develop and improve you know, Abraham was only 18 last year yeah, yeah. Abraham's different in terms of their build yeah Abraham's I mean, a big I mean, lad I mean, yeah. Abraham you look at him and you think oh you're a big strapping lad 
you know, put himself about, you know, it's 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 a different physical yeah. presence there as well. And we've made that point as well about the size of the team. Yeah. It might be that he's now looking to try and bulk it up a bit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. With bigger players. The other issue as well is is we already have two young strikers. Yeah. So why are you gonna why take game time off Azor or Magic to give it to a Chelsea Loney yeah. when you don't even know if the other guys are gonna look at what the Chelsea want out of it as well. Are they yeah. Yeah. Want he has playing to play every week, wouldn't they? Yeah. 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 yeah, he has to play X because of course this happens now. You know, the loaning club, you know, will say like he has to play X amount of games or you're going to get fined. Um, Cardiff have got this position at the moment as well, this problem the with... The yeah, Stuart, yeah, yeah, his yeah. Liverpool guy. Yeah, think... it's basically if he doesn't play a set amount of games, Cardiff get fined. Well, talking about that, leaves Sunderland with Galloway then. And part of, <laughs> well, part of me, you know, I look at that <laughs> and you just think, Farman. really, you know, I mean, it's, it's a two-way thing. You know, why would any club want to go into a situation like that knowing they could get fined? And having other teams, basically other managers, almost kind of, um, you know, dictating, make, yeah, yeah, dictating, yeah, dictating you know, the think, rules. Like I said earlier, I think I think Hull are in a similar boat, aren't they? They've got Chelsea Loney's making up most of the defence, and they're not playing very well, and they've, they've got to play um, because otherwise they're probably. Yeah. I presume it's the same situation there. They'll yeah, be fine. Apparently, the apparently their left back's been awful for ages, and he. You can't get him out of the team because he's got a play. Because he's got a play. Yeah. Oh dear. All right, we'll throw another question out there. Um, this one's from Tom Atkinson. He says, "How did the club move forward with such enormous amounts of debt? Uh, somewhere in the in the region of two hundred and fifty million, I think." Well, the debt's not two hundred and fifty million anymore. Oh, is it not? It's around about one hundred million now. The right. debt. So the debt has come down significantly. I mean, that was effectively why Martin Bain's been brought in. Mm-hmm. I mean, he doesn't like the term hatchet man, um, but, you know, that's what he's been brought in to do, is, is to basically reduce the costs left, right, centre, up, do you, down, every way you can find Do you know, Nick, you talk about the debt being 100 million, is that the debt, that's bank debt, or is that including the, the Ellis Short that debt? That doesn't include the Ellis Short. Debt. Right, because so the, the Ellis Short debt's like two, 70 million or something. Yeah, so there's two sort of right. separate, um, there's what he bought the club for, which is nothing like... You know, it was, what, 30 million, I think, you bought the club for? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then you put 100 million debt on top of that, which is the, the what's owed to the banks and 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 whoever else. Um, so you know, Martin Bay's made significant inroads into that, um, and you'd hope that now the parachute payments from this last season have gone to to pay off a, a significant amount of those. I don't know how much more Ellis Short wants to use from subsequent parachute payments to dig into that debt. Well, I think we'll only find out in the summer as to what the budget's going to be in the summer for, for, mm. for players. And a lot of that will depend on what division they're in. Um, so they are in a better shape than they were, clearly. Uh, Ellis Short um, has taken a back seat, it, it is really not involved day to day in any shape or form. I think the only involvement is basically to make sure that the, the debt doesn't get any bigger. It's almost like you know, you're putting in his pocket money every month just to keep it ticking over, but there's no significant input. Um, so the running of the club is now down to Martin Bain with Chris Coleman as the as the football manager, if you like. Mm-hmm. Uh, where that leaves them in the long run, I don't think we'll really know until the summer, because I think that's you know the the the, the, the big question mark is, is is as I said before, what division they're going to be playing in. Um, you need hope it be the championship, and you'd hope that if they're in the championship with Chris Coleman at the helm, that he'd get some sort of promise that he could you know invest significantly enough to build a squad to take them out. Uh, if it's League One, then it, I, oh, for my, my mind, worry. it's a real worry. Mm. This is uh, the thing. I mean, the only way now, you know, when you're looking at, uh, and this is the vast majority of clubs in the, in the in the Championship, and even you know League One, you know, the clubs who've gone right the way down, the hulls are the same, and everything like that. The only way you can wipe that kind of debt debt out that has accumulated over a number of years is basically avoid relegation, mount some kind of promotion campaign, go up. The only way you can clear those debts, basically, is to somehow stabilise, turn around and try and get promoted back to the Premier League, which is the golden goose, which will give you enough money if you run a ship sensibly to kind of clear those debts and maybe rebuild again, start again. The idea of that happening now, of course, is, you know, it's one step at a time. But I think, as Nick says, you know, the thing is, don't go down. Yeah, I, I think, think that, I think that's the big thing. When you go down, got to avoid. Yeah, then you're looking port, yeah, Portsmouth kind of, you know, strife. You know, everyone remembers. Well, you know, I think what there's a, to them you, when they your, went your down. Your gates are hit. Your incomes hit. Sunderland are lucky in that they've got the three-year parachute payments. They're not in the situation that you know clubs like 
Middlesbrough who only go up for a season and come down and only get a season's parachute mm. payment. Now, Middlesbrough have gambled, obviously, on putting it all into going back up this season. If it backfires, then they're in serious financial trouble. And that's the way but, it is now for so many clubs. You know, really from kind of, you could say, from about 10th or 11th in the Premier League to the bottom of the, of, of, of the Championship, with the exception of maybe Burton Albion. You know, yeah. who are just happy to go along with the ride and good on them, quite frankly. It's great to see them there, you know, running things, you know, on an even keel and, and doing pretty well as well. You know, but for the rest of us, it is just trying to balance the books and stay afloat and pay the it's, bills. It's, it's stabilisation. I mean, that's what they're looking for. And that's why I'm hoping that they can stay in the championship, that the next parachute payment will go in some part to give him just Coleman yeah. some sort of fighting fund and some sort of to do something so the ability yeah. to do something yeah. yeah what worries me is if we do go down this year is the academy is now producing players for the first team but will they continue funding the academy how will teams look at our younger assets who you know Azoro could be worth money in the future but how will people look at them if they're playing League One football you know, the valuations of them players like shoot straight down you're not looking at Azoro if he has a good year in the championship next year could go for 10 plus but if he's in League One then that's just not going to happen like, it concerns me about if they go down where it leaves them young players and where it leaves our I presume the strategy now is to produce them younger players well I think at the how moment does that work I mean fingers crossed I think at the moment the club are behind the academy because there are teams like Huddersfield and a few others who've actually scrapped the academies yeah. Yeah. and decided yeah. that they're not worth you know the investment and they, they've just abandoned them altogether I mean, Sunderland have just clung on to their status for the academy. And I think the view is that they will look to the academy to, to bring young players through as a way of, you know, as um, brutal as it sounds, but saving money. It means the club mm -hmm. don't have to spend money. They don't have to buy players. They can start producing players and hopefully get a return on those players well, they're producing. It's, it's the best way to clear the debt, really, is you need to try and produce Pickfords and Hendersons yeah. and callbacks. I, I, I worry about people's jobs, the ground level stuff's jobs, personally, like yeah. academy stuff's well, jobs. Yeah. There's that as well, because I think the, you people, know, in the, the good people in the black, the black hat house and stuff like that. I mean, we've already had redundancies this season well, gone, you, end, so. you end up with a white elephant situation don't you well, with that, stadium. Well, that, that stadium in League already, 1 already disastrous mean, they're talking next season the upper level being closed and, and you know, imagine League 1 football that's definitely going to happen and then your staffing levels on match days because your gates are going to go down to what they're going to go down to 14, 15,000 that seems to be the, yeah. the solid support and you know the, the club's it's quite bizarre. It's, it's very, very different to. What's it? I'm, I think I'm correct me if I'm right in saying, but Sunderland have only ever been down to the third tier once. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Now, when you went down before, there was a real air of almost celebration with that one season you spent down there because it was very, very galvanising. You know, you played well. Gary Bennett was in that team. Benno was in it. Benno was Gagnardini, in it. But they were able to buy players in and bring players in that could take them straight back up. And, I'm and not they so did. Sure they did go. Well, this is what I mean. It's, it's a different animal. It's you know, different. it was Roker Park was smaller. You could pack it out every week, or you had your, you know, your twenty twenty five thousand. It quite easily. You had a good start. It quite easily became quite a happy ship, and they did well, and they got promoted as champions. Brighton, my team, went up a second. That's why I remember that season. Every game that the two clubs neck and neck for so long. Um, but it is very, very different now. That was Roker Park. It's a, it's a completely different setup to kind of now being in, in, in that great palace around the corner. You know, League One there. I mean, that's a scary thought. But I don't know. Don't worry about that until it happens. <laughs> that's the main thing. Stay up. And I, you know what? As again, speaking as my, I'll put my impartial hat on here, says he putting his impartial hat on. I think Sunderland will stay up. I hope you're right. I really and do. I, I, I really think there was something's turned. You can see one or two kind of dropping down. You know, we were talking about Hull. You know, the trajectory is just going a bit wrong with them. Mm. Sunderland are kind of, you know, they haven't fallen any further. That's mm. the main thing. And it's it's important for the city that, that Sunderland stay up as well because the, the club and the economy are, re are really, really strongly linked. And y you could possibly say that for a lot of teams in well, I was going to say, for, in, for every club like that, you can say, but in, I know what Sunderland, you mean. In Sunderland, it seems to be I know what significant. You mean. Local civic pride and everything. Yeah, yes. definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, talking of local civic pride, actually, yeah. today marks the anniversary of the Man United Cup semi final win. Um, what are your memories of that? Just t t touch on it briefly, just for a bit of positivity. That, for me, was one of the Peter best Maloney, days. Peter right at the end. One of the best days of my life ever. The best day of my life. I, I was, There's a piece up on the site today from me about that, but yeah. Uh, best day of my life by a country mile. The thing, the thing I can remember is, is <laughs> either the scoreboards not working for the penalties, or everybody not being able to work out. So when Minone saved the penalty, everyone 
but the whole crowd didn't know what had happened and only realised when the players started players running. Know. The players didn't know. Yeah, and then they started running towards Minoni yeah. and then there was this kind of delayed reaction and having kind of two away ends as well because you had the bottom tier and the upper tier and there yeah, was an yeah. echo in the Oviedo Minoni chance. I'll, I'll never forget that as long as I die. Just, that, and just remember <laughs> bodies piling everywhere and ah, yeah, grown remember, men crying I remember everywhere. crying my eyes out like... <laughs> oh, I've never cried like that in my life. It was extraordinary because <laughs> right, right at the end when, when Minoni made the save, and um, within seconds of that happening, someone pulled our line out, and uh, I thought, God, the, the, you know, thank God it was seconds after, not seconds before. <laughs> it was one of those horrible that? moments when you're in a cold sweat. <laughs> Can you imagine that? And it's just steps up last, to take that, and it's gone because you, know? <laughs> you were at the will of the because the line that our lead was like two, three seats underneath. Yeah, people's feet, two or three yeah. let, rows down, and you. Reliant on nobody sort of jumping up and pulling it out, and of course it went seconds after. Yeah. The... There's that brilliant video. The it's an American guy who filmed, filmed the away filmed, end, yeah, yeah, and yeah. I've watched that a thousand it's times because he gets it perfectly. I love watching the away ends go up and down. Yeah. It's even better when it's your own. I don't think I'm betraying any secrets that afterwards. Then Vito Manoni was selected for the drugs test, and uh, he doesn't drink Vito, mm. and uh, he, he couldn't couldn't wee. And he was there for ages and ages. They were desperately trying to get him to do the test. So they gave him, they basically gave him two or three pints of lager. So he was hammered. Absolutely (laughs) hammered. I mean, he was going to come out and do an interview after us, but in the end they said, he's done. sorry, he's just too drunk. (laughs) <laughs> Which well, is if you're ever going to if you're ever going to go alcohol for the drugs test, but yeah, that's apparently what they did. Well, if you're ever going to break so, your duck and go for a beer or two, that was the that's absolute, 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 isn't it? That's it. <laughs> and as we've always had this affinity with goalkeepers, Vito's kind of part of that legacy as well. Yep, again, yeah, Ted Doig, yeah, M- Montgomery, Lee Roos. I don't know who's your favourite Sunderland goalkeeper from your days. <laughs> Lee, Lee Roos for me. For well, Lee Roos, I'm pers- your, yeah, I'm oh, personal because I've written his biography, but um, but yeah. So I'm a bit. Tommy I'm a bit Sorensen. I, Sorensen. I don't know. I like watching Pickford. Just oh, yeah, the, the local lad coming through. We'd Obviously, be, a wonderful goalkeeper. We've been blessed with goalkeepers, which is why it makes it so frustrating for us at the minute. Because Mark Poom. I mean, uh, Poom was, uh, Poom, I, I like. I was in the away end. The day he scored against uh, Derby, Derby with a header. I was. Brilliant. Who was your keeper at the end of the seventies when he went up? What seventy? No, nineteen eighty. Who was the keeper that season? Seventy nine. Tony 80. Norman. Uh, no, no, it was no, later. No, 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 Trying to remember who that was. Oh, Siddle? maybe Barry Siddle. Yeah, Barry I remember. Siddle. I'm old enough to remember him. I don't know if he was the keeper that year, but yeah, he was. He was, yeah, he was a good keeper around that time. Yeah, yeah, good pair of hands. Ian Hesford. Ian. Always remember. Do you remember Ian Hesford nice. coming down to Brighton and going in? You know, chanting down. You know, coming down the field. He was a big boy, Ian Hesford, <laughs> wasn't he? I remember. I think that was possibly the first time I heard the pie Funny chant. Enough. To see, <laughs> he came down towards the North Bank at Brighton. Past all, keepers, um, and... before the Cardiff game, um, Benno and I met up with Andy Dibble. Oh, um, yeah. Season at Sunderland on loan when McMenemy was the yeah the manager. But, the, but they both left Cardiff on the same day. Dibble went to Luton and Benno came to Sunderland. Yeah. But um, Dibble's now the goalkeeping coach at uh, Cardiff. I tell you what, on another yeah on another day, if the circumstances had been different, I mean, Dibble could have been a Sunderland legend. I mean, he went on to Luton afterwards, didn't he? he and did. uh, won and the Man League City Cup. And all sorts League Cup, we went all round. Yeah, good keeper. Very good keeper. But yeah, I mean, that was dark days, wasn't it, really, under Laurie Mamenemy and, you know, the relegation and everything. All right, he bounced back the following year, but by then, I think Hesford came in and replaced him. Was Dennis Smith? Dennis yeah. Smith, Dennis manager. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 You know, we never look back after that, really, and that's kind of what makes it. Uh, that was one. That was a, that was a really strange time because you know back then, you know, I lived, eat, breathe football even more than I do now. You know, when you're a kid, when you're a teenager, and everything. And growing up in the south of England and having Laurie Menemy managing the team across, you know, just across in the next county from Brighton, you know, you think when he left Sunderland and uh, when he left uh, Southampton rather than came up to Sunderland, you think, wow. They're going to be going places. Was off the back, and they did. They, they went down. Yeah. They didn't go up. Yeah, it was. I just didn't see that coming. That was the end of his. That, that time, was the end yeah. of his managerial career. Was not commonly it, really? referred to as Killed Mac Mac Enemy yeah. now, isn't he? Mac yeah. Enemy. Yeah. Mac yeah. Enemy. Well, that was the big thing with Moyes. Everyone was saying he, he, Moyes is the worst since Mac, Mac Enemy. Yeah, well, we we're thought it was what eighty-seven, so we're over thirty years since we were last in the third tier. Um, and you were only there for one year, yeah. and you won the league. So everyone looks back with rose tinted glasses about, well, it was you know it was a good year, turned it round. It was a good way to turn around, yeah, because we did get ourselves back on an even keel. Players like Mark Gabbiadini came into the club, and you know it is very different now because I mean you do look at a lot of clubs that go down to League One, and even League Two. 
you know, that are so, you know, I, you know, Nick and I will have, you know, covered them, you know, remembered them in the Premier League. They go down to League One, League Two, and they're still there. Portsmouth, Wigan. Yeah, Portsmouth, yeah, um, can't get out of League Two. Blackpool, you know, know others, yeah, Sports Coventry's, big, you know. They, they were one of the ones with big financial problems in the same way that Bolton had yeah. big problems, Leeds had big problems financially. But then you, the, the other side of the coin, there's Leicester. Or Southampton. Southampton, who, who've yeah. gone, in the last gone, 10 years, have played down there. And looked but in fact, Southampton, down and come back. Right, but Southampton yeah. the club that, bizarrely, it was Alan Pardew but used that relegation as the time to turn the system around and actually produce produce young yeah. players through the academy. The list yeah. is endless from Southampton. Lalana, Bill, Walcott, yeah. the, the, the yeah. Chamberlain. Yeah. Chamberlain, yeah. That was, the, that was the turnaround for Southampton, mm. that relegation. But for every Southampton and Leicester, there's another one that's still down there. You know. Sheffield United really struggled for years yeah. to get out. I think when you're yeah. talking Sheffield about yeah. rebounding from a relegation, probably the the main reason we've struggled so much this year is you, you, you can't just it's not like a light switch you can't just turn off that losing mentality that mm. that negativity there's a there's an ingrained mental attitude around the place um, certainly amongst the fans and in the players that is kind of contributed to where we're at yeah and that builds as a process but and it also takes time to reverse it does, doesn't it? and you know people people from outside the club often say why does someone keep sacking managers you can't, if you look back I think we sacked Grayson other managers left of their own accord we haven't had we haven't really been afforded a chance to build um, I know obviously the ownership and the lack of spending and stuff has cost us dearly mm, um, yeah. and, and obviously bad investments too on top of that but I think this is the manager that you've got to get behind this is the yeah. manager that if there's any man out there capable of turning something around it's Chris Coleman and yeah, when you, you you look at the appointments made by Premier League clubs recently uh, Paul Lambert you've got you've got like Pulis going to Borough we've really come out of this quite well considering yeah. our position yeah. and we've got to we've just got to hope that Coleman isn't going to eventually find it all too much and walk away because I mean I if I'm talking three, four years down the line, I'll see us back in the Premier League with him as manager. I, I, I like about him as well as uh, Nick can confirm this. He, he moves, he's moved his family up here he's as well. Moving his family, yeah, he's which, to move up which here, is yeah. something I don't yeah, think a sort of manager's done for a while. So he yeah, seems he's, invested he's, he's, in the he's area. He's a very proud man, I think as well. I think he's very, very brave man. Yeah, <laughs> bad, bad, brave. Um, <laughs> but I think he sees the bigger at. picture. I think he does see that that you know the when he took the job, the the, the, the picture of him was this is a big club mm. and if you get it right here then you know you're set for life. I mean he said as much in his interviews and and he also says, you know, he might not be here in six months' time. So he's yeah. pragmatic in that sense. But isn't that the way to be, you know, if you're not going to go wholeheartedly into a job, what's the point? And yeah, that's, that's I think Chris. he is he is that's what he expects of his players. Yeah. I, you know, they will always reiterate that, you know, whatever the problems, forget what happened last week, look forward, it's always going to get better and I want players that want to be you All know, I have that heart. Yeah. Well, I that, one thing that I can fight. say, I mean, Wales has been in mourning ever since he uh, ever since he left. Oh, I think I think the feeling was that he might go. You know, surprise was that he went to Sunderland. I know, but ever since he's gone, and Ryan Giggs is still a little bit. You know, you do look at that and you think, really, Eight, eighteen consecutive Giggs. friendlies he missed uh, after his debut for Wales. So he's not the most popular. My my family down there aren't really enamoured with the, with it's, the appointment. It's 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 been a big split. You know, most people are like, okay, well, you know, let's move on, you know, and everything, you know, together stronger kind of thing, which is the Welsh motto at the moment. But again, you know, a lot of fans do remember him not turning up for friendly. But then again, that worked in his favour, didn't it? Over mm. this, you know, yeah. by being withdrawn from friendlies and playing sparingly, you know, Ferguson managed to eke him out to what thirty eight, thirty nine. But there's the other side of the um, there's the other side of the coin as well. There's reports of kind of Ferguson coming in the dressing room and saying to Hughes, like, right, you can go and play for Wales, but saying to this kid Giggs, you're definitely not going. Giggs isn't going to argue. Do you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it, this is Alex Ferguson. So th there's, there's something in that as well. I think. To stand up to him. Yeah. Yeah. On, on that subject, you, you, um, you look at Coleman when he was at Wales, and Gareth Bale was always there, every friendly. Yeah. Um, that's, that, what, that, that's the kind of man he is. That even, even going yeah. against Real Madrid at some point. Yeah, yeah, at some that, time, that's Gareth what Bale. Coleman gets players to want to play for him I think is the most important thing <clears throat> and you, when we are talking earlier about bringing players in and stuff it is going to count for a lot who he is mm, and play, yeah, like definitely. say players talk and you know you look back at his successful Wales and you Wh Wales hadn't qualified for a tournament since 1958 well, it, 1958 it's yeah. amazing really and you, top 10 in the FIFA rankings that was half the Madden's. success he had with that squad that qualification though was very easy to qualify for that Euro but like, it wasn't very easy to get the semi it wasn't very well, easy to get Welsh the semi-finals one. well just that Euro qualification it was like 32 teams wasn't well it? the weird thing was teams. and that's yeah I, I felt for Wales a little bit there because they would have went through e anyway they would have 
gone through, you know, by a distance anyway. But every yeah, you know, a few people were like, "Oh, well, you only qualified because six hundred and forty-four teams all qualified yeah. for this time, and you know, <laughs> everyone's going by a dog and whatever." But no, they would have they would have gone through. I mean, they were outstanding. No, oh, yeah, in that, in that qualification. I mean, they deserve they probably deserve to win the group. I mean, Belgium <laughs> pit them in the end. But... There's a great film about that. Jo- Johnny Owen directed it. Uh, what's it called again? Don't take uh, me I home. believe it. No, don't, I believe uh, Miracles is no, the forest no, one, is it? isn't it? It's yeah. Yeah. called Don't Take Me Home. Don't Take Me Home. Yeah, yeah. It's brilliant. Yeah, it brilliant is good. Film. Not as good as I Believe in Miracles. I Believe in Miracles is the one is about notch. Nottingham Forest, which is very, very good. If you haven't seen that, anyone, watch that. Even if you're not a Forest fan, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's it's just a great film about film. a great period in football. That's good. But yeah, the um, Don't Take Me Home, yeah, it's pretty good as well. Uh, one th- I watched. I only watched it the other week and one... Um, one big thing I picked up from it was just how close a relationship that Coleman has with Johnny Williams, mm. which is and you, he spoke um, last week about Williams coming back in the team on on the club website, and he said you know Kit Simons called him that day that he took the job to let him know that um, what more and Williams had both you know suffered long term injuries and it was like a dagger to the heart because he was kind of looking at those players to be the ones that helped drag us out of the mess. Yeah. So. I'm really, really looking forward to seeing what Williams can do under Coleman if he stays fit. I mean, if is the operative word, yeah, but I think I think we're just if he can get players in that team who who he he knows he can count upon. Yeah. In terms of the way he plays and what he expects of players, it's gonna make a hell of a difference in this run towards the end of the season. I don't uh, think I, mean, I don't think he could have went he, I don't think right now he could go out and find a player like Johnny Williams. He's well Johnny like, Williams, yeah, you know, I mean uh, <sighs> pretty sure I'm right in this Johnny Williams I'm, uh, really ended up filling in for Bale when Bale you know um, you know kind of, forward yeah yeah, yeah. And, <clears throat> and and did brilliantly did absolutely fantastic when there was uh, when they had to reorganise the team you know the balance of the team if somebody you know was injured or whatever Williams was the one who seemed to come in at uh, left back, right back, midfield, left midfield, right midfield, goalkeeper it's like <laughs> Johnny will you play there? Yes it was he brought this immense unsung can-do attitude to that team and I've got to be honest I think most of Wales hadn't heard of him Johnny Esther that. Johnny Esther he's known as no well, I remember when who, who did the play in the um, was it Republic Island Republic yeah, Island. And all, all you heard was the Johnny Esther chant like, yeah, and he yeah. wasn't even on the pitch mm. that's how well thought of he is by Will and then you think of like his time so far son very underwhelming I don't even think he's played consecutive games he he been been quite quite when he was coming on though you could see oh yeah yeah have. and that's, that's that's the thing you know you know fit, that there's a player there if he's fit he could be a catalyst yeah. but we, we, you know? we spoke when we when we signed him we spoke to um crystal palace fan sites and they were they were raving about him he was, he was barely fit barely Ipswich. fit for them but they, they loved him nonetheless when he was at Ipswich on loan as well they loved him there yeah, loved him, yeah, you know we're, we're, we're talking about a top player when he's fit probably should be playing premier league football but that's probably why he isn't because he's just this, exactly. 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 it goes back yeah. to that uh, that look thing doesn't it that, yes, that, that looked yep. good. Yeah. All back to luck. Yeah, that keeping fit. Right, we've got we've got a couple more questions to end on. Um, Lee Jenkins asks, uh, "What are the feelings behind closed doors with the players at the moment? Um, do they seem like they're honestly bothered? And is this an impossible job for Coleman?" Uh, I think the players are bothered, despite what people say about them. Um, it will be a if Coleman keeps them up, it would have been a fantastic achievement. I don't think there's any question. Bearing in mind, you know how handicapped he's been. With injuries and lack of money, um, but it, you know, you, you, when you when you talk to the players, there's there's no question, there's no there's nobody there. Those that, that didn't want to be there are out mm-hmm. um, largely. And I think if if it comes to the situation where Coney and Dong don't go, well then they're going to knuckle down. They'll have to knuckle down. Um, so the, the you know the group that are there, uh, look, they might they might be fallible, they might be flawed, but um, you know there is a spirit there. Um, and if anyone's going to get it out of them, it's going to be Chris Coleman. Yep. Um, what else have we got here? Um, yeah, a weird question here. Would you bring back kind of the Barini, Kazri lens options at the problem, end of the at the end problem of the is problem is is that in the case Th- there'll of Barini, be loan agreements in the case of lens yeah, yeah. Con, they're basically sold. Mm-hmm. So um, Kazri is the only Kazri and, Kazri and Jilabodji Jilabodji are the only two that yeah. can come back. Mm-hmm. Kazri thinks he will be back in the mm. summer. Dilla Bodji, I forgot, Bodgy, forgot he played for us. Who knows? Did, who saw his two-foot <laughs> tackle up last week? What, sorry? Dreadful. He's, he's currently serving a three-match ban in France. Is he? Last minute of the game against, I think it was Bordeaux. Yeah, it was Bordeaux. Um, it's an awful tackle. You need to look it up. We had it on the website. He two-footed off the ground, lunges from behind. Yeah. And I'm surprised he only got three games for it. But it just sums him up. That's mm. He's just so erratic. Mm. And you wouldn't thank him 
I don't know, would you really? I don't care how desperate we've been this season. It, probably best it, you don't want a liability at this stage of the no, season. The Barini really? and Lens wouldn't. I mean, even if they could come back, I don't think either would come no. back. But then Wabi Kazri's went to, went to Rens and done quite well. Injured at the minute. He got injured last week. He's hurt um, his breastplate or something? Breastplate, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. The corner of the keep. But, um, we should uh, quickly touch upon the, um, the old Rodwell interview in the Daily Mill. Because that was big news during the week, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. It was, yeah if, to, to me, me reading it from a fan's perspective, I thought it was a bit of a come and get me plea. To be honest, I, I think I, it was I, a cynical ploy I, by I, his I, agent. And I Jack thought Rodwell it was very embarrassing. Their side of the story, and the bottom yeah. line is, um, it, it's a horrible situation for Chris Coleman to, to have to deal with. But I think he's right. He's, he addressed it again last week. Jack Rodwell told him at the start of the window he doesn't want to play for Sunderland. The club then said, okay will rip the contract up you become a free agent you can go wherever you want to go but since then Jack Robert has not come to the manager and said I want to play mm. well I think you know Chris Coleman's right until he's knocked on his door and says I'm prepared to play yeah um, you know he's not going to pick him if he wants players that have committed that doesn't show commitment to you've me you've got to prove yourself haven't you yeah. you've got to prove you want to play he's, he's deluded as well I mean he, he reckons when he's fit then he'll be he'll be able to get back into the England squad when he's at his best as time. a centre half good yeah, luck well, I think a lot, I mean, the, good the, luck. The, there's a lot in that article you look to, I take with a pinch of salt the bottom mm. line is the other side of the coin is look I've no gripe with Jack Rodwell in the sense he signed a contract which is worth yeah of course however many thousand pounds a week that's that's what you do I mean you know he's he's, he's com- entirely within his rights and with his means to say we probably wouldn't rip it up an hour would you oh, never, no, never. Of course I, you I, said, I said this last week so said, you, know. I, you know I can see I can see both sides I can see where you know morally yeah, that's the big issue I think from yeah, which is Jack what I highlighted Robert. last how, week how well did Chris Coleman deal with it he came straight out and he didn't shirk and he just said look this is how it is and, and I'll give it, Chris Coleman his due as well yeah. he only did that when he was prompted by the media to do it yeah. because when he's asked about when I've asked him about it, and the others have asked him about Jack Rodwell or the players that he wants to leave Kone and Dong and Rodwell mm. he's always spoken about Kone and Dong and unhesitatingly never mentioned Rodwell's yeah. name until it came pushed to shove and he was asked directly what is the situation with Jack Rodwell Pri- privately he must mm. have been very annoyed though when that interview has come out I think privately he's furious with the player yeah. I think you've got to just let him rot in the reserves I don't understand why they're letting him <laughs> get away with not playing at all is, the fact all... he didn't mention Rodwell obviously is some kind of sign that you know it's like look if you want an opportunity and you want to turn around and you want to work here you know you can the opportunity's there whereas you know the players he outs yeah the door's not shut yeah. to him and the thing is he's doing you know you're in this, this in this situation where the player's doing everything by the book yeah He's doing everything by the book. I mean, people say sack him. Well, you can't. Yeah. He's done. He's done nothing wrong. He's training. He's mm-hmm. fit. He's available. Um, but you know, they're, they're, then you've come this impasse as does Chris Coleman play a player who is fit and is available, but clearly doesn't want to be at the football club. He did that with Ndong at Cardiff, mm-hmm. didn't he? And he got sent off. And it, and it ends. And it, it, <laughs> it, actually, it can be counterproductive. <laughs> You yeah. know what? What? What are they going to do in the end? Are they going to, you know, are they one of the others trying to force the other's hand? It's and, just another sideshow, isn't it? And it's but, as I say, it's a distraction. But the one thing you can, can say again, that. as an outsider in my shoes looking in, is there are fewer sideshows now. You're getting them sorted out, or he's getting them sorted out. Chris mm. is, so you know. Moyes would have masked over that absolutely. Yeah, you know, and he did. He did, didn't he? There was a there was a lot going on privately with Corney and he was still playing him he made him uh, and in fact Grayson as well had the same problem captain. Grayson made him captain in one game mm-hmm. you know and this was a player who you know off the pitch was you know very vocal and mm-hmm. and let the club know that he wanted to leave and mm-hmm. he's made captain on the pitch I mean I can understand why would, sometimes why managers would do that you see, know it's like look sometimes come on, I give them some responsibility yeah, and sometimes, sometimes it can be a work, work for in a the positive, case of Sunderland I don't think I think for a long time that's been a problem that's one of many reasons why we're in this situation with players is that we've molly coddled them we've been too nice and at least Chris Coleman's coming out now and said nah the end of this Yeah. I mean I don't care if you don't play I play this kid who's 18 year old never kicked the ball in the championship ahead of you every time because he wants to play and that's why I mean I'm really defensive of George Honeyman I think I think he's given an unfair treatment by a lot of Sun fans because yeah, he's not too. he's not Premier League and at the end of the day Neither he are we. goes onto the pitch. <laughs> no, but he goes onto the pitch and he and he gives everything. He's vocal. He quite clearly loves it. Oh, he, he, would, uh, he, he, is, he would play he, anywhere he, you told him. Adores it. I mean, all the young players. He speaks to them, and it's the, every game they play, this is like their dreams. Give me, give me, give me that over 
did you own Dom? Speaking, really speaking of Kevin Ball about Honeyman as well once, and Kevin Ball was saying that Honeyman was coming to him saying, why am I not starting? Like, I want to be in around the first team. He was that eager, and Kevin Ball saying, with all due respect, George is 16, and he's going, yeah, but, but Rooney but Rooney had Everton, he's, and Kevin Ball's <laughs> yeah. going around well, that, saying, I mean, with all due true. respect, George. I mean, in, in, in fairness to Honeyman, Asoro, Madger, those players have been champing at the bit for a couple of seasons, and they've mm. been kept, you know, Grayson and Moyes were keeping them out with the first team. And by average I, players I, as well, um, though. I remember Honeyman playing in pre-season under Gus Poye and looking good and still never getting in the side yeah. and know? they were getting frustrated by it but you can, so at you least can now why. they've got their heads you know, and then Coleman's you, allowed them to do that people use George Honeyman's age as a stick to beat him with Abby's he's 23 year old it's I very think well it doesn't matter he's, he's still young mm. he's not played a lot of football anywhere but a brief spell at Gatehead Look at- and he's come in he's come in and he's Shoulder had a lot of responsibility, I think. Sometimes as players, though, you d- they just need that time. Hurrain, you know, he yeah. he yeah. took a very long time to get where he is now, and he's what twenty six, twenty seven now. Sunderland sold him for a million quid. But Jamie Vardy, his breakout season came when he was twenty eight. <laughs> Exactly, it happens. Mm. Not Eight. all players develop at the age of 16, 17. No. Some don't develop until 24, 25. And that's why we're starting to see a lot of players coming from non league and league two. And, uh, and, and yeah, some like, like Ricky Lambert, remember him, you yeah, know, yeah, always, yeah. you know, thinking, why doesn't anyone take a punt on Ricky Lambert? And finally they did. Grant Holt. Grant Holt. Well, someone like Rodwell develops early and, and seems to tail off in his career. Yeah. Well, only one person's going to suffer from the current situation, and that's Rodwell himself. Yeah. Apart from not, his bank it? account. Yeah, yeah, apart exactly. from his bank well, account. Well, 5.4 yeah, million. million you know, but what do you take to the, you know, what do you go into all Old age with well he, he commented <laughs> in the piece about wanting yeah. to um, to provide memories for his, his son who I believe is only two year old yeah. yeah which he's going to have to start quickly because yeah. his time's yeah. running so, out yeah. <laughs> who's going to take him I mean who in their right mind is going to look at this situation the fact that he's played so little football and it's not just Chris Coleman he's played under Gus Poyer he played under Dick Advocat he Moyes. played over Moyes who had given uh, his day Allardyce well. Moyes Grayson and now Coleman, six managers he's been through, and not one of them has picked them regularly. Not one of them has he been fit for regularly. Not one of them has he given his all for, or he would have been in the team. And you've and got you've also got to remember all of those managers are very well known, prominent managers who will be going out there. They're not all Sunderland, idiots, are they? You know, not into planet I mean, football as well. Um, you know, managers will be asking them about what do you think of, of Rob Bell. Yeah, well, also saying, touched yeah. on in that interview, you know, Rob Bell talking about it, but how they've even had to go so far as to try and make him a centre half. To, yeah. to, to get him he, to play. He played there and it's in the under oh, no, in that game at the Czech same trophy. Way. He played in the yeah. and didn't stand out defense. at all. Well, Made a mistake in one of the games. I, I think, think the only game he stood out in was the preseason one at Bury at the start. When, with all due respect, you were playing Bury in League One. Yeah, mm. We're talking about a man on seventy grand a week, and he <sighs> with no relegation re- release clause. I mean, the, the, redu- the reduction clause is way. It's a poor decision made by Sunderland, really. Uh, one of many, but under an old regime, you can't blame Martin Bain for that. It's you can't and- blame. It was Lee Congerton in charge at the time of transfers and whoever else that was involved. All right, at the time we all thought good signing, bit of pedigree, you know, faltered a little bit at Man City. I don't think anybody could predict this, really. No. Um, but there's there's got to be something within Rodwell himself which thinks, you know, when I look back at my career, like you've just said, mm-hmm. when I look back at my career, what have I done with it, really? I made a lot of money, but that's about it. Yeah. You know, he, he had a real chance especially this season what what really rankled with me with that interview was that he he made out as though he's been overlooked essentially mm. and I thought where have you been like we've we've really scrimped this season we've got kids being thrown at the deep end in pressure situations in in big games at the bottom of the championship where have you been if you've been fit what, what? I don't know whether players now still keep scrapbooks I didn't realise that players kept scrapbooks for years until quite a few of them were coming you know, come okay? to me and, and say you know, oh, can I have a copy of that? Or can I have a mm. copy of that? Or can c- can you make sure you send me a oh. copy? And it was like, really? You know, all this stuff about, oh, we don't read anything that's written about us right. is, is total baloney. Yeah, because because players, and players like love reading lovely stuff about them. Well, I'll, I'll not, I always yeah. remember David Weatherall <laughs> at Bradford, you know, after he yeah. scored that winner against Liverpool that kept them up that one season. And I, I wrote a piece, you know, a match report of that. And um, I didn't see him again until pre-season training. And uh, he came up. He's like, you know, any chance you could get a copy of that for me? You know, because my dad's got all my scrapbooks and stuff like that. That's what they want to look back on. You want to look back on something. You want a legacy, decent. don't you? Yeah, a legacy. I'll not, yeah. I'll not name the player, but twenty minutes after the Cardiff game ended, a Sunderland player got in touch with us to correct us on something in the match report on the website. Yeah. Name minutes. the player. Name the player. Name the player. 
off Come on, buddy. first nah. team player. <laughs> but he, he got in touch to say, oh, no, that wasn't me. We made the mistake for that goal. It was... We, we've had we've had comments from That's from former 20 guests. Minutes within twenty minutes within full time. Yeah. We, we, so it just shows it just shows they read everything. Hmm. They read absolutely everything, and I suppose now as as a fan site and as fans. I mean, we we do speak our mind, but we do have to be careful. Certainly with kids. Well, that's the thing. What I was going to say, we've had um, former guests come out and say, you know, the kids read everything, and it can yeah. knock the confidence at times. And yeah. but it, I mean, we've got quite. I would say our coverage of the under twenty threes is quite good, and nearly every time we put anything out about the under twenty threes, the family get in touch. The family love it. Mm, that's great. They, lo- they love to yeah. see. They love to see stuff written about them. So it's a it's it, yeah it's a fault. It's recognition. It is, which is what yeah. you want, isn't it? And, really. And really, the I guess when you look at the, the squad that we've got now with all these young players, they'll be loving the admiration they got after that game. They'll yeah, be on yeah. such a high. And like you said before, they'll, they'll want to start against Birmingham. They'll want to play exactly the same. They'll run themselves into the ground. All right, the quality might not be there sometimes, but it'll more often than not, you know, it'll come good. Especially this, in this in this league, you look at some of the teams that we've we've beaten this season. Spent a lot of money. Um, some of them have got. I mean, even you look at the you look at Middlesbrough's squad, for instance. I know we we haven't got a better Middlesbrough, but teams like that where they spent a lot of money. Some of those players probably, I think, underestimate the the position they're in and think. You know, you think like a club like Sunderland, forty odd thousand fans on a good on a good mm. weekend. If yeah, we're doing, yeah. I mean, we were doing well this season. That stadium would be nearly full. Last season, yeah. when we were getting beat every week under David Moyes, there was still forty thousand plus on the gate. Yeah, you know what I mean. Mm. We'll turn up. In our numbers, if the team's doing if well, the team's doing well, and we'll do, we'll turn up in our numbers. Not may not be as much, but they'll turn up if they're not doing so well. And it's such a big opportunity for Coleman, for the players, anybody coming here. You've just got to. You, you don't even have to look that far back. I mean, when we beat Everton under Sam Allardyce, yeah, the place was, was bouncing. Place was bouncing. We're on about eighteen months ago. Mm. But even on it's Saturday, there was a feeling. I've just felt there was a buzz at the end. Yeah, yeah. There, was lacking, there was a feel, when, different feel. There was a different feeling. Lee Catamore made a mistake, and asked. I turned around to my mate and I said, like. If we were getting beat one 0 not winning one 0 the, the yeah, it would have been a different sort yeah. of reaction to that. But he didn't. He got applauded, and people sing his name, and that'll have. I think that'll have given Catamore a boost because I mean, I've I've been a big critic of his this season. So have many other Southern fans because he hasn't turned up more often enough. Mm. But that was like a corner turn for him as well. You know, there's, there's there was something a little bit different about that victory. I felt a, a bit of a turning point. Well, hopefully we can take it into the game against Birmingham soon. Um, me and Connor have got an exam tomorrow, haven't we? Yeah. So we're gonna knock this on the head because we're getting all night. This might be the this might be the longest podcast. I think this could be the longest podcast ever. I'll end it. I'll end it by going round the table and getting a um, a score prediction, please, from each of you for the Birmingham girl. I'll start with Connor. Well, it depends what the squad is. I don't know. Um, I'm. I'll say we're one nil. I'm confident one nil. I don't think there'll be many goals in it, but I think we do. We do go there, you know, with a bit of confidence. And like you said before, Birmingham can't play at home. We don't see. I think. I think it's a tough ask to to ask Sunderland to back up a win with another win. <laughs> but there was just something a little bit different about Saturday. It's got to happen at some point. Well, was, when right. did we last win a league game at Birmingham? Well, we're going to beat there. Mm-hmm. Won a couple, there, couple of years ago. What was that? Was that? scored a good goal. What was that? One nil from you, there. Connor. One nil. Um, I've, I've said one nil. Yeah. Nick. I th- yeah. Go on, Nick. Whoa. I, I, it's a tough one for me. I just I don't want. I don't think they're going to lose there. Hmm. By the way, Birmingham are they're dogged, and Steve Cotter like I wouldn't rule out a one-one again. Yeah, Spencer, two 0 uh, Sunderland, two 0 Sunderland. Ooh, I'm gonna go with I'm gonna follow Nick, but I think it's gonna be a nil-nil draw. I think, I think we'll go there just to keep things ticking. I'd, I'd take a nil draw. We need a win, but we need to start no, checking. Go there, there play high around. up the pitch from the start. Wait for somebody to shank the ball out of the pit, you know, out, out on the uh, into the stands, and they will. Turn, turn. We need to remarkably turn the fast. Fans. We and need it to will play get nasty, and providing Sunderland are like you know wise enough to capitalise on that and think, okay, right, this is ours to lose. Go for it. We need to play like the teams who've done well at the same right have played. You know, and they've yeah. all just got my faces, made sure we make mistakes rather than them doing anything. Play like we did on Saturday and we'll win. Yeah, I think it's that's essential. First, the... Yes. Man, right. Sunderland, Sunderland don't come from behind uh, so. No, <laughs> um, we do have a Birmingham preview podcast with Birmingham fan site the what is it Tilton Talk it's Show it's a radio show is Tilton it a radio show. Yeah, yeah, the Tilton Talk Show good. fantastic um, so that'll be out later in the week with Graham be sure to catch that uh, you can subscribe to the show on iTunes Acast and YouTube we'll be having a new kind of historical themed edition coming soon which me and Spencer worked on earlier today uh, look out for that so tell a friend tell a family member the more people that listen to us ramble the better also any feedback 
looks uh, appreciated. Even Only if you want to nice feedback, even ah. if you want to throw counters at us, we uh, we enjoy the uh, the criticism. Um, and thanks to everybody who left responses on the three word review, etc. We've actually got Danny Collins next week yeah. with any luck. Former um, Sun and Player of the Year, that's Brazilian, isn't he? Brazilian yeah, national. That, uh, they should play. <laughs> Still lives up here. Well, that's why he's coming in. Yeah, yeah. So um, <laughs> he's kind. He's kind. We're not paying his expenses. <laughs> but yeah. Um, and be sure to check out all of the daily content over at RuggerReport.com. And once again, Nick and Spencer, thank you for travelling over. It's that's fine. Uh, just put one quick word to David Robinson, the one who was on Twitter earlier on. Uh, Anna and I are going nowhere soon. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, if no, this if nobody's seen was um, a very vocal David who um, uh, questioned um, Nick and Gary's uh, ability but, uh, we'll buy him some which is often questioned don't worry about that and, uh, <laughs> and thanks to Nick for bringing in the Harry Balls as well which was uh, right, which I'm going to take a pack of home uh, which was <laughs> 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 thank you very much for that right Done. cheers see you next week see you later see you later